Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning, everybody. And a very warm welcome to the International Peace Institute and to the uh, sixth annual Trigvili Symposium on the topic Combating Hate Speech, Everyone's Responsibility. Uh, it's, it's actually, has been, uh, it's kind of strange, but uh, we started this six years ago. Um, and uh, in order to honor the first and founding Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, without whom actually um, the uh, UN headquarters would not have been in New York, and without whom these buildings across the street would not have been there. And we are very proud um, of um, uh, Trigvili being Norwegian, as Espen and myself. So this is one of the reasons why we've been doing this for six years now. And, and it's, been, it's a particular honor to have you here with us uh, today, uh, also because you are now, after many years of service, both as Minister for Defense and as uh, Foreign Minister of Norway, you are bowing out and uh, uh, leaving your chair to what was just a few weeks ago the opposition, but which is now um, uh, taking... Um, responsibilities for the government of Norway. So it's been great having you, you with us for many years as Minister for Defense and as a <coughs> Minister for Foreign Affairs. I'm also very pleased to um, welcome the excellent group of presenters which we have with us today. We have the, pri the privilege of hosting a very good and uh, old, don't misunderstand me, Marty, friend of IPI, namely Marty, um, who is the uh, Foreign Minister of Indonesia and a former permanent representative of his country here at the United Nations for many years. And we've been working very, very closely with him, both in his previous capacity and also in his capacity as Foreign Minister. Indonesia is the uh, fourth most populous country in the world and has a large number of minorities living side by side. And the country has taken great strides into democracy. It has shown great leadership when it comes to balancing the responsibility to respond to manifestations of hate while still upholding fundamental freedoms. The subject we are addressing this morning is one that is at the heart of all democracies around the world how to protect people from the repercussions of hate speech, intolerance, and discrimination, and at the same time, continue to respect the freedom of the press, the fundamental freedoms of opinion, and expression of all citizens. And in that connection, we are also very fortunate to have with us today Frank Lavie, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right of to freedom of expression and opinion. This topic deserves special <clears throat> attention by the global community in order to spread the understanding that combating hate speech is indeed everyone's responsibility. It is important to be able to draw similarities across countries and come up with viable solutions to address this issue at all levels. The media has notoriously been used to disseminate hate speech and fuel racial tensions, but more importantly, it is at the same time a powerful tool to combat negative stereotypes, misconceptions, and counter discrimination and other wrongful acts. So I'm very glad that we have here with us today Sarah Wynne Williams, the head of global public policy at Facebook, and Aidan White, the director of the Ethical Journalism Network. And I very much look forward to their contributions uh, this morning. Civil society is often at the forefront when it comes to combating intolerance and discrimination. It is often members of civil society who lead the way to hold those responsible for manifestations of hate to hold them accountable. It is with great pleasure that I also welcome Amanda Decker, Minister of State of Belgium, and Caroline Criado Perez from the Women's Room, and our special guest in the front row, human rights defender Vic Victor Mukasa. Before we begin, may I remind you please to uh, silence your cell phones. Can you please check? <coughs> Though we um, encourage you to tweet this event. 
It is now my great pleasure to hand the reins of this year's Trigvili Symposium over to the Foreign Minister of Norway, namely Aspen Barteide. Aspen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tarje. It's uh, great to be uh, with you. It's great to be here at the IPI uh, again. Uh, and uh, the Trigvili uh, Symposium has really become uh, uh, a nice tradition. Uh, and it's really good to see this uh, turnout, uh, even early in the morning. morning we Norwegians uh, like to get up early. Uh, it's good to see that that uh, habit is spreading, uh, even uh, here. Um, I, uh, um, I want to start by saying that this is, uh, the title of this seminar is uh, Everybody's Responsibility. But I want to, and that's actually a very carefully selected uh, title, because uh, one of the things I think we shall be discussing when we hear the different presenters is actually uh, who, <laughs> who is everybody, or in, in which context and in which role should we uh, uh, address uh, this issue. But before we come to the conclusion that it's everybody's responsibility, I would suggest that we also start by recognizing that it's everybody's problem that uh, this is everybody's problem in the sense that uh, expressions of hate speech occurs uh, across nations, across cultures, uh, and, and is not sort of localized uh, to any particular part of the world or, or to countries in a particular, uh, particularly difficult situation. It's something that can turn up everywhere and that does turn up everywhere and probably more than before. And I'll come to the reasons why. We see this in Norway. I mean, Norway has, uh, of course, first we have been a couple of years ago the victim of a heinous terrorist attack uh, generated by a far-right extremist that, uh, that was uh, deliberately attacking uh, immigration, uh, not, with it, not by attacking the immigrants, but by attacking the people he saw as the responsible for the immigrants' entry into the, uh, the country. That was uh, more than hate speech, that was hate action. But when we look back to what this uh, person had been doing in his uh, life uh, until uh, then, there were no criminal records, but there were uh, a long list uh, of activities uh, in, the, uh, in the cybersphere. Uh, on, uh, uh, on what he had been doing, and that was clearly expressions of uh, hate speech, and a reminder that from hate speech, it's, uh, uh, the road is not always that long to hate action and, and hate crime. But we also see it in my own country, and I want to begin with our own experiences, that Norway, which is a country that hardly has any unemployment, and uh, seen from the outside have a rather limited uh, amount of problems uh, compared to uh, most other uh, parts of Europe, for instance, since we've been able to steer through the financial crisis with, uh, uh, you know, without actually being heavily affected. Uh, we still see that uh, when a few hundred or thousand Rom Roma people stray into Norway uh, in, uh, you know, every summer, uh, there is a lot of activity as if this was an avalanche of uh, a really serious problem. Uh, and it suggests to me that uh, it is not necessarily uh, volumes, uh, but, but simply any kind of uh, uh, challenge uh, to, uh, to what's perceived as uh, normalcy that can stimulate people to say things that are uh, frankly quite outrageous. And, and these, uh, these things are some, sometimes said in, uh, in public and in normal media. But of course, one of the particular challenges that we have now is the advent of uh, social media. And uh, the good thing, which is that everybody now has access to, to spread their ideas and their views, uh, which is a fundamentally democratic feature, fundamentally changing the world uh, in better ways, but it also has some side effects. That, uh, and one of the side effects is obviously that uh, while uh, in, in the old days, uh, uh, an extremist might, if he was lucky, uh, find five or six uh, extremists of the same leaning uh, in his neighborhood uh, and could start a very little club. But uh, with uh, uh, cyberspace, uh, the, there is no opinion that is uh, so strange or so extreme that you will not be able to find some people out there uh, in the universe of seven billion people who shares your view or will start sharing your view. So, of course, that means that we have, we have gotten into a, an arena where, where the normal physical limits uh, does not apply, neither the physical limits of closeness nor the physical limits of purely local or national media outlets. We really have a global media scene. And that also means, has another implication, which is that everything we say, like when we webcast this program, for instance, or this meeting, and everything else we do, is actually immediately available to everyone who might be interested. Unfortunately, not everybody is interested, but some people will be interested. And that, uh, and that means that, that we, are, we are constantly engaging in a global public discourse. 
uh, with myriads of actors. And what is said in one context can be understood in a completely, completely differently when it is received in a different context. We, were, we, we saw a lot of that when, uh, when we had the, uh, uh, the, the famous um, discussions surrounding the uh, cartoons depicting uh, the Prophet in ways which uh, many Muslims uh, you know, reacted very strongly to. And we, had, and we got straight into one of these uh, real dilemmas, which is uh, the, uh, the, the confrontation between the norm that a lot of people have, that there are certain things you cannot say about the Prophet, and another norm, which is that there, there is nothing you cannot say. Uh, which are not one norm against a non-norm, but, but alternative norms uh, in, in an international system. And this, this, um, this means that we have some really serious uh, things to discuss, and which I very much encourage all the speakers to address, because I suspect that there are not uh, a very high number of supporters of hate speech in this audience. Uh, so it would be easy to have a vote and say that we were against hate speech. But we want this seminar to be much more sophisticated than that. We want it to address the real dilemmas. And what is the dilemma? Let me just remind you. A dilemma is not uh, the situation where you have to choose between an obviously good outcome and an obviously bad outcome. That is not the dilemma. That's just, you know, doing the right thing. A dilemma is when you have to choose between uh, alternatives which are either both uh, positive or either both negative, and you have to judge them. Uh, that's when you really have a dilemma. And in this particular theme, um, we have a type of dilemma which we, for instance, do not have when we go to other meetings and talk about global public health. You know, I mean, it, it's obvious that more health is better than less health. I mean, you can discuss how to get there, but it's hardly a dilemma. It's just, uh, you know, it's, the dilemmas are in the instruments. But here we have dilemmas at the core. And we have, and I really want to encourage you all to be frank and open about that fact uh, when we go through the list in this um, uh, of, of uh, excellent speakers. We really, um, we always, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition uh, to get people uh, to uh, meetings during the UNGA, uh, because the whole world is here, the whole world wants uh, everybody's attention. We, I, I'm very proud to say that we got exactly the speakers we wanted. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we, we think we have here a very broad specter of people who represent, uh, who have experiences of being, you know, on the the, the victim of hate speech, the, the, uh, the recipient of uh, the terrible uh, statements and, uh, and incitements. Yeah. We have people who are trying to sort out uh, how media should deal with this. We have uh, Facebook. We have uh, my uh, very good friend and close uh, partner in so many debates, Martin Atalagawa, who uh, the foreign minister of Indonesia, with whom we have uh, you know, a, a, deep, uh, a deep and close uh, partnership on, on so many global issues, because uh, under uh, his leadership and his president's leadership, Indonesia has really become a country that has taken a position way beyond itself on, on these issues through the Bali Democracy Forum, Bali Media Forum, which we work uh, actively with, together with Adrian White, for instance. And, uh, uh, and that's why I'm re really happy that you are also here. So with, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, and if I may suggest that uh, Mr. Frank Laru, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Pro and Protection of the Right to Freedom and Expression and Opinion, if you could please uh, take the floor first. And let's all be uh, sharp and focused and to the point, because then we have time for interaction. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and, and um, I, I thank uh, Norway and, and the International Peace Institute for this invitation and to be here. I will be very direct and very frank. My report uh, to the General Assembly of last year, in, in, uh, presented on October 23rd, uh, which eventually was not really presented orally, but only written because it was when the flood uh, happened here because of the rains, um, was specifically on hate speech. It was very difficult as a rapporteur to talk about the mistaken use or the wrong use of freedom of expression or the limitations. And, but I felt it was inevitable partly moved by the events precisely in Oslo that had shocked the world. What can move a person on the hatred of a policy against other peoples uh, to do horrible events in any part of the world? And my conclusions were general. And this is why, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the title. I think this issue, as all human rights, is a responsibility of all. I always begin my presentation saying that when we talk about universality of human rights, we talk about universality in terms of the enjoyment. We should all enjoy all rights completely. But we should also all assume responsibility for the enjoyment of those rights by everyone else. 
because this is the way the network of human rights works. Of course, the state has an obligation, a legal obligation, but we as individuals, as human beings, have a human responsibility, an ethical responsibility, to share the promotion and protection of human rights of everyone. And this is a very important concept. Secondly, in my report I say that, first of all, freedom of expression, and especially the use of internet, which I strongly believe in the development of new technologies. It was the foresight of those that drafted the Universal Declaration that said we have the right to seek and receive information or impart and disseminate information and ideas through any means possible. They were already looking at the possibility of changes in technology. And internet, because of its interactive nat nature, became sort of, and I say in Spanish, a plaza pública. It is the public space where we relate, we mingle, we exchange, and should have the least limitations, only in those cases that are really criminal action, but in general should be open. We benefit. It is true, and we were commenting right before, that the internet brings out the best of us, but it can also bring out the worst of us. But this is the nature of human beings, and this is the nature of the dialogue we have to have. Now, where do the limitations fall? And here I go into Article 20, and I know this is, is still very controversial. I say that there is two obligations of the state at the beginning and at the end, and then a big obligation in the middle for all of us as civil society and especially the press. But the first obligation of the state is prevention. The most important policy, and I say it in my report, is prevention. We should avoid the need to use any other measures or to lament any other effects. And prevention especially means, in the world of today, training young children, young girls and boys to use internet. Internet is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, necessary for education, necessary for communication, necessary for development. But it also has its pitfalls from cyberbullying of children to the use of incitement to organized crime or terrorism in other conditions. So we must train our next generations in the good use and to learn about the risks and dangers and how to prevent it. This is very important. It's also a responsibility of parents. But I think the, the states have to include this in the educational system of all, of all schools around the world. So this is the first responsibility of the state, preventive policies. But then, what happens when we do go to the extremes? What is the extreme? Article 20, which is the basis of my mandate, uh, Article 19 and 20, and, and what I tried to develop in the report, gives indications, but there's problems of interpretation. Yes, the, it says the state should prohibit, it doesn't say criminalize, by the way, it says prohibit speech that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence on the basis of race, nationality, or religion. Now. What is incitement to discrimination, hostility, and violence? In the case of discrimination or violence, I think it's easier. Hostility is the most vague word. So what I tried to do, and I think this is my obligation, is to reduce the intervention of the state to the very minimal by elevating the standard. I believe the state intervention should only occur in the most serious, serious cases. Otherwise, there are many political leaders around the world that would use the argument of hate speech or would use the argument of human rights in general, but to justify forms of censorship. And this is very dangerous. My position as a rapporteur is always to reduce the role of the state to the very minimal in regards to freedom of expression, to allow precisely to the, the, the free flow of ideas and, and knowledge uh, around the world. I said in my report five, a few standards to, to, to limit that. I, I say it to begin, the state does not have an obligation to protect individuals from offense. Offensive speech is terrible, is dreadful, but does not fall under the responsibility of the state. It's an ethical matter, a social practice, but the state has no intervention in that. The, the state only has the responsibility to protect from serious harm. And serious harm meaning acts of violence, of course, against one or several individuals, or in some cases, acts of serious discrimination, which will marginalize sectors of population or people uh, from the enjoyment of rights. In this case, we can go even beyond race, nationality, or religion to gender 
and and aggressiveness, uh, the misogyni misogynistic uh, messages, or for sexual option and preference, or for disability, which in some cases uh, occur. What are the standards? And, and with this, I would finish. The standards is there has to be clear malice, clear intentionality of harm. There has to be an real and serious harm possible. There has to be the immediacy of that real and serious harm to happen. There has to be a proximity of that happening. And there has to be a, a, a message that goes beyond, that disseminates beyond personal contact that can actually incite many other people. And finally, it has to be in the context of danger where this message will actually provoke more harm. And here I'm concretely referring to the prevention of genocide, for instance, which is in the Convention on the Prevention of the Crime of Genocide. We all remember how we did not react appropriately to the radio Milcolin and the incitement to genocide. So there are extreme cases of incitement to genocide, incitement to terrorism, child pornography, which is an incitement to sexual abuse of children and trafficking of children. Those are the extreme cases where the state must react. But also react, I think, not only from a freedom of expression point of view with censorship, which is the easy way, but should react with criminal law, investigating those responsible, and then apply the justice system, which is the real solution. So this is the position I have in the paper. There has to be a specifically a prevention. There has to be an intervention of the state in the cases of extreme harm. But in the middle, and this is the most important part, there is a space for ethical standards. First, of all society, there's a responsibility of parents, there's a responsibility of churches, of societies, and especially of the press. I'll let my friend Aidan develop that, but we have jointly talked about the new ethics and the new challenges to media ethics with the outcome of the new technologies. I think this is clearly important. Ethics is always a voluntary decision of values. So the most important element is prevention as a state policy, the insistence on ethics as society, and the intervention of the state if and only there is an immediate possibility of serious harm. Thank you. Excellent, Frank. Thank you so much for, uh, for that. And uh, then I will turn over to Ms. Sarah Wynne Williams, from, who is the head of global public policy at Facebook. I'm really happy that you're with us. And as a very central uh, social media provider, uh, this is, these are issues that you've been dealing with very actively. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, one of the challenges for Facebook is that we're a platform of over a billion people across virtually every country in the world. And um, that means that we're sort of, we're on the coalface of um, operationalizing a lot of what we're discussing here today. Um, <clears throat> I think. Well, I hope that there's no one in, in the audience that would consider that the engagement of a billion citizens online is a bad thing. Um, for us, it's incredibly exciting. One of the areas in particular is the, the two-way conversation um, between governments and between its citizenry. That's, that's an area that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Um, but there, there are particular challenges. Um, I think in terms of... Uh, the way this discussion is is framed around responsibility, we take we as a company take our responsibility in this space very seriously. Um, but the next step is, how do you operationalize that? How do you operationalize that in a way that's meaningful um, in countries that have very different um, understanding? You know, and it's the same. There are issues around definition. If you had to write a law defining hate speech, not all of us would not necessarily come up with the same definition. We certainly. The other challenge is that we want to be an, an enabling technology. We want to facilitate the exchange of information and. As Mr. LaRue said, we want to put as little friction, as, as little barriers in between that. Um, we don't, as a company, we don't want to be censoring um, free expression. But there have to be limits and the challenge is in defining those limits. So um, we, have a, we have a policy as a company that hate speech is, is not tolerated. Um, it's, it's very strict. 
there is we don't think that there's any gray area around that um again it comes back to how do you operationalize that and part of that is uh we've we've come up with a number of solutions so some of those are uh policy solutions and that uh, we've taken, I think, a, a fairly robust definition of hate speech, um, and that's that's caused a lot of debate internally. It's also something that, frankly, has been an evolution and something that, uh, in terms of defining these standards, is we're still a very young company, although we have over a billion, uh, billion people online. We've, we've only been in existence for 10 years. And we've been on the cutting edge of a lot of very challenging issues. And uh, that was something we discussed before, is that the, the internet um, does does provide tremendous opportunity. Um, I think the role that I've had has also allowed me to to see some of the, the things that you never expect. And, and we, have, um, we have a team of incredibly dedicated professionals whose job I cannot imagine. And these, these people receive the reports of hate speech, of, and, and they have to make the assessment about when to pull, pull that material down. Um, and this is an incredibly new area. So not only did we have to define the policy, we then had to train these people to identify it. And then we, we employ people around the world across many languages whose job every day is to review material that's uh, been on our platform, some of it unspeakably disturbing, um, and remove that so that people on Facebook are operating in a safe environment. Um, when when we first started, the tools weren't available, so there wasn't a culture on the internet of reporting speech. That that doesn't that doesn't exist. That's in many ways an, an anathema to the way the internet operates, and so we had to think through a framework of how, um, how you identify and then what's the mechanism. If you, if you find, if you see something that in your construct, in your cultural construct um, is hate speech, how are you going to communicate that to a global company? Um, and one of, the, one of the areas that we've really evolved is on, on our reporting mechanisms. So now on virtually every piece of content on Facebook, you can report that. If, if you believe that it's hate speech. Now, that of course opens up the possibility of abuse mm. and the possibility that people will use uh, those mechanisms for censorship or to control the, the free expression that is taking place. Um, and in addition, laid on those challenges is the challenge between where responsibility of um, companies, of uh, citizens, of the general populace starts and stops and where the responsibility of, of governments lies. And there's a, there's a real tension there because as a company that uh, operates in very, across very many different legal frameworks, we, we have to comply um, with government regulations. And um, Ms. LaRue alluded to the, um, the ever-present threat that governments use, um, f use, I think, uh, language that can be construed as <coughs> very well-meaning, um, but it's used to control and centralize power over information. Uh, and for us, there's a challenge there because once it's law, we, ha we have to comply. So part of the, the role that my team takes is, is engaging with those governments as they start to think through regulation of freedom of expression or regulation of online content. And it's an incredibly active field and each government comes at it with its own <laughs> cultural framework. Um, and they. It's not something that a government thinks of in a global context. So when you're a, a global company, you have to adapt and, and explain the ramifications, both in terms of operationalizing um, and, and what this means in terms of actually removing people's right to say what they want and their right to, to freedom of expression. Um, I think the other challenge uh, that Mr. Uluru alluded to was where hate speech stops and starts and where there is speech that is offensive or controversial. And that's something we thought very deeply about in terms of developing our terms um, that everyone agrees to when they sign up to Facebook. So although we prohibit hate speech, we do allow offensive speech. 
and we do allow controversial humour and believe me that speech can be very offensive and that humour can be very controversial uh, and it's um, there's a value you know part of the issue is that there's no global value by which you assess whether something is uh, offensive or, or where so each person brings their own set of values and I mean I find just a, on a personal level um, working and being based in an America in America when I I'm not American I bring a different cultural um, take on what is freedom of expression and what those limits are and it's in, and part of the the challenge um, that we really embrace at Facebook is really having all of those views represented and not simply having one set of cultural values defining those norms. Um, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious that I really do want to hear from the other panelists and, and the audience, so I'll, I'll conclude my remarks. But I, in addition to the, the responsibility that everyone's talking about here, I'd be really interested in, in the operationalizing of this because I think that um, I think we're there and I don't think necessarily it's a, it's a space that people think about or contemplate a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for that. And it's, uh, I think it's a cr extremely important to hear the discussion that you're having on the inside of a truly global company, which has a tremendous imp influence on, on what the world looks like and, and, and how the world is developing. Thank you for that. Uh, I then think we should move uh, to um, Ms. Caroline Corrado Perez. Uh, she is uh, very active in this field, has many uh, uh, opinions uh, that uh, on this, but she also has the uh, uh, mixed uh, blessing of having the experience of being on the receiving end of uh, hate speech in the grand scale. Uh, so I think uh, your voice here is uh, extremely important for us to hear. hear. Please, uh, Caroline. Um, well, I again wanted to pick up on the, um, on the title. Um, everyone's responsibility um, because I do think it's, it's really important. I think a lot of people sometimes frame this as as something that oppressed groups need to deal with and everyone else can kind of get on with their lives. Um, but at its heart, this is a societal problem and a cultural problem. And if it's something that we want to change, we need the whole of society to engage with it. And we need to look at all the aspects of our culture that are creating this kind of hatred. Um, because, you know, we can look at social media companies and we can look at the police and we can look at our laws. Um, but in many places, these laws are in place. Of course, they need to be enforced and in many cases they aren't. And it was quite disturbing when I was on the receiving end of um, very graphic and violent rape and death threats, that it seemed to need a huge amount of media focus and power for the police to actually take action. A lot of women got in touch with me to say that they had experienced what I had gone through and the police had not done anything. They'd said, it's not a matter for us. They'd told them to make their accounts private or to, in, in fact, in one case, one woman who was tweeting about racism, a black woman who was tweeting about racism was told to stop tweeting controversial things if she didn't want to receive rape threats. So obviously we have a problem with laws not being enforced um, and that's, that's something that definitely needs to be tackled. And again, that's a sort of cultural problem within the police of understanding what the laws are and that they can enforce them and should enforce them. Um, obviously the internet has brought a certain problem to this because it's made the, the problem much more visible and much bigger. It's much easier to contact someone and send them some hate speech than it was in the past. For, you know, for a start, you'd have not needed to buy some paper and a pen and find someone's home address or office address and you know, post it. And there are all these actions that would have acted as barriers, whereas now it's incredibly easy. Um, but again, you know, I want to pick up on this idea of the internet being an incredibly fantastic and powerful tool. It's a powerful tool for everything that humanity is and stands for. And humanity does contain a lot of hatred, but it also contains a lot of passion for the good things. Um, and I think it's important that we don't get too bogged down in the negative side. We do need to address it, but not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, and say that the internet, as you know, some people have started to wonder, particularly given, um, well, certainly when they're speaking to me, given what I've been through, they sort of think that, you know, I must hate the internet now. But I don't forget that actually the internet was what enabled me to challenge the media in the UK on the really bad gender ratio between um, male and female experts. It enabled me to take on the Bank of England, a huge public institution who in the past would have been able to tell me just to go away and they weren't interested in what I had to say. But because of the internet, I was enabled to make them change their minds about... Um, having an all-male line on top of banknotes. Of course, that then led to me getting rape threats from a certain sector of society. Um, so, 
to, to, to look at that and why I received this level of hatred for such a relatively minor thing. I was just asking for some women to be represented, for our culture to say, you know what, women have contributed to the culture as well, so, so let's celebrate that. Um, and a certain sector of society took very violently against that. Um, and I think what that highlights is that preventative, as Mr. LaRue said, is really the key here that we need to be looking at why we have a certain sector of society, which seems, I think, to be more widespread than we perhaps would have realized before this summer, that seem to hate women. Um, obviously, I'm speaking from my perspective, and there are other types of hate speech that go on, but I'm, I'm speaking about what happened to me. Um, but this does hold through for other oppressed groups, and it's going to be things like the education system. And for example, in the UK, I think we have four women in the whole of the history curriculum which obviously doesn't accurately, accurately reflect what women have actually contributed. Um, in the media, we have, every, for every five experts, one will be a woman and four will be a man. That doesn't accurately reflect the level of expertise in our society. So we have, and, and you know, something like as small as banknotes. We were going to have a very big cultural institution that everyone was using every day and seeing that was just gonna have white male faces on it. And when you have a culture saturated with white male faces, it breeds an expectation that women aren't really supposed to be in the public sphere. And that is what leads to someone like me appearing in the public sphere and as a result getting rape and death threats because these men felt that I didn't belong there, that by my being there, I was taking away something that actually belonged to them and that I needed to be shut up. I needed to be got out of the public sphere. I needed to be silenced. And I suppose the final thing I want to talk about as a result is this idea of how we should deal with hate speech on an individual level, which is don't react to it, you're just giving them what they want. And I think that that is a very, it's a marked lack of understanding about the type of hate speech that I was receiving, because actually what they wanted was for me to shut up. And so if I shut up, I'd have been giving them what they wanted. Um, and so obviously, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to do that. Um, and I think it's important that we differentiate between things like someone just deliberately trying to create a fence, which I think is the traditional definition of a troll, and someone who is actively trying to shut someone down and get them out of a sphere that they consider to be theirs. Um, and so really, I would say that what this, this leads me to, to think is that we need to have a discussion about freedom of speech and what it means. I think we have quite a simplistic um, idea of it in our society, and we need a more nuanced one. We need to think about the impact that your freedom of speech has on my freedom of speech, or mine on yours. Um, and if we classify hate speech that is intended to silence someone, and in fact often does, um, many of the women who got in touch with me to say that they'd received the same kind of thing said, I was, I was silenced by it, I stopped campaigning, I stopped speaking out. Um, that's something we can't let happen. If we love freedom of speech, as I think we all do, we need to make sure that everyone has access to it. And if we have a very simplistic understanding of it, as anything goes, you can say whatever you want, we won't have freedom of speech. We'll have freedom of speech for the people who shout the loudest. And I don't want to live in that world, and I'm pretty sure no one else does, or I hope no one else does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Caroline. Uh, very important statement and uh, a lot of a lot of things to follow up on. I will then uh, ask uh, Martin Natalegava, the Foreign Minister of Indonesia, to uh, give uh, his comments uh, to this. And uh, now, after hearing the UN and a uh, large private company and uh, the civil society, now it's uh, you're the first from government, in a sense. Here. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Espen, and thank you, Teria, for the forum that we have this morning, a terribly important one, obviously. Freedom of expression or freedom of speech, including the use of the internet, is not, is not a license to promote hatred. I think we should be absolutely clear about that. And as the title of the present uh, forum designates, combating hate speech is everyone's responsibility. And I have to say I concur with the thoughts expressed by Espen and many others just now on the kind of the nature of the problem, uh, the nature of the challenge 
uh, that we are facing uh, just now. Uh, simply to add one further dimension to the unique nature of the internet, <coughs> apart from the many qualities that Espen have, uh, highlight, has highlighted and others have mentioned, is the element of anonymity about it all. As if you can simply launch out there some hateful thoughts, ideas that reflect intolerance, not only in words, but in pictures and image, and simply hope to get away with it. I know of many an instance where images irresponsibly posted over the internet, and I see here Excellency Ambassador Nambiar. I remember when we were dealing with the very then very difficult, fast developing situation in the uh, Rakhine state in Myanmar. Some images of some other event having taken place elsewhere to do with natural disasters was posted on the internet and described as being had come up from real time situation on the ground at the time and immediately create a new cycle of hatred, of tensions, of distrust, etc., etc. But the internet is only a modality. It doesn't have its own dynamics. There are people behind. There are people who exploit, who abuse the internet. So it would appear to me the response is not mechanics. It's not about dealing with the instruments, but it's dealing with the persons. Education, our friend and colleague just now had mentioned. At the national, at the local level even, how do we deal? Why do people behave in this way? Why are they showing intolerance? Why can't people simply get along? Education is critically important. Above all, as I understand it, our forum this morning's emphasis is in the, on the word everyone's responsibility. I think all of us throughout this morning will define, will extrapolate, will describe the nature of the problem. We need solutions. That's what we need. Especially, we need a clear manifestation of that sense of common responsibility. I'm afraid sometimes when we are at the national level trying to combat, trying to overcome hate speech, sometimes we feel our efforts are undermined by those who choose to confuse the debate as if somehow this is an assault against free speech, as if it's an assault against freedom of expression. We need everyone to speak up, as we have done in this room. Don't be discouraged. Don't be confused by this attempt to somehow make the issue of hate speech somewhat confused with the con concept of freedom of expression. We need to be able, Espen, to be able to come from a forum of this type to have a clear steps, actions, to manifest what had been now only national level concerns into collective, global, everyone is responsible, concrete, actionable steps. That's what I think we need. Otherwise, we will be simply pockets of concern, disconnected from one another, not knowing what one is doing at one different corners of the world, fearful in our isolation, and wondering where, what others are doing. In this connection, uh, Espen, as I was been, I've been thinking about this a little bit, only in a, in a, in a, just, especially just now prior to our meeting, I believe there are a number of concrete, actionable steps 
that we can begin to think about, hopefully in an urgent basis. First, the idea of having a model legislation, a model national legislation to combat hate speech. I know that some countries have, uh, over the years, through its own national situation and circumstance and traditions and experience, develop and have their own national legislation in dealing with hate speech. Perhaps we can all sit together, have a, a model national legislation. It's only a sample to be adapted before adopt, adoption by the countries concerned. But that would be a useful exercise for many countries to be able to have a, almost like a shortcut. This is how a model national legislation on hate speech may look like, of course, to be suitably adjusted by the country concerned. Another, whether it be in addition or alternative step, Espen, beyond, uh, rather, instead of uh, national model legislation, could be a registry, a registry of national steps that governments, civil societies, and other stakeholders have taken at the national steps in combating hate speech. Tremendously important resource for many of us. It's not meant to be a report to where certain countries are put in the dock, but simply a voluntary registry these are the steps that Indonesia have taken or have tried to take, Norway have taken or have tried to take. Then we can look at one another, not trying to judge one another's efforts, but to learn, to draw lessons, to compare notes. I think that will be very, very useful to many governments. Greater still in terms of its potential impact, is some, some sort of global guidelines in dealing with hate speech. National legislation model, registry, guidelines. What are steps or guidelines that, that governments may wish to conform in order to ensure that hate speech is combated? The fourth option, though it may sound somewhat abstract, is a political declaration. All of us, I am ready to join with Norway and many others, adopt a very simple one-page declaration, a call that we will combat, we are going to work hand in hand in addressing and in combating hate speech. Indonesia will be host to the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Conference next year in August 2014. We will be very keen to make that meeting, that forum, as a forum to launch uh, this type of political declaration. And lastly, and uh, probably the most ambitious program, is if we are to have a legally binding covenant or, or instrument, not to limit freedom of speech, not to limit freedom of expression, but simply to address, to make sure that the efforts to combat hate speech is meant to be in synergy with the principle of freedom of expression. I believe there is enough reservoir of goodwill and enough wisdom amongst us to be able to find that balance, that synergy between freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and hate speech, uh, combating of hate speech. In essence, therefore, uh, Espen, we are all, I'm sure, on the same boat in wanting to combat hate speech, but we need to give a clear manifestation of the concept of common responsibility, of everyone's responsibility. Otherwise, what we will have would be simply pockets of concern 
disconnected from one another, but we must actually rally and find and connect those dots of concern and to make it one big cycle of common concern. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Marty. Thank you so much uh, for, uh, for that. And uh, it's very good when uh, people in seminars like this uh, come, come up with concrete proposals, because then we know what to discuss uh, in, uh, uh, after the introductions. And I, I really would encourage people to, to, to respond uh, to the very specific proposals from uh, Minister uh, Martin Lagaba. Then last but not least uh, uh, up here in the panel before we go to our special guests is uh, our good friend and partner, uh, Mr. Adrian White, the director of the Ethical Journalism Network, who really has been thinking on uh, about these issues and also has been very active in promoting uh, uh, an approach to relating with this among media organizations, uh, newspaper uh, news stations and so on. And, uh, and I would very much like to give you the floor now. Thanks very much indeed. Look, I, <clears throat> I'm... I mean, I, I must say it's been very helpful to sit here listening to the, the, the various statements. And um, I mean, I've heard on either side from me, I, I think really excellent presentations which highlight the <clears throat> degree of the problem that's being faced. Um, uh, when we sort of take a concept like everyone's responsibility is hate speech and then try to translate it into the realities on the ground. And that sort of problem is felt more, I think, by journalists and by people working in media than most others. Because because the problem facing uh, media are absolutely uh, enormous because uh, media are, remain and are the most important vehicles by which people are receiving information, certainly about current intelligence, analysis of what's going on around them. Even in the age of the internet and free expression, media remain absolutely, the pri traditional media remain the primary sources of, of, of information. And within media and, and journalism, we have um, major problems, major problems around how do we continue to do our work in the context of dramatic change changes that are taking place within our industry. Those uh, changes have put severe pressure on the traditional concept of media responsibility and uh, ethical journalism. Uh, we, have a pro we have a problem, but also a great benefit of having the audience as part of the news gathering process, thanks to the internet, thanks to the social networks and so on. We now are uh, uh, able to join and work in partnership with, with the audience. But actually that has a downside too, because the downside, the downside is that very often and sometimes the, the audience will actually be leading us in directions which are, are not very helpful. The, day, the work I'm doing these days is, is to try to work with others in the uh, international uh, media scene, working with owners, with media editors, with uh, 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 journalists across all platforms to try to rehabilitate the craft of journalism at a time when journalism is under uh, tr tremendous pressure. Because journalism, uh, I, I have to say, I always begin with this sort of very sim sort of simple concept Concept, uh, concept, which is, although we all enjoy and believe in the importance of uh, free expression, journalism is not free expression. Journalism is a form of expression which is constrained. That is to say, it's free, of course, but it's constrained by the values and core values of, of journalistic work. And these are, very simply, to tell the truth or to be accurate, to be as independent as you can, to show humanity and to be aware of the potential damage that you can do to the community, to be transparent and to be accountable for your work. That distinguishes what journalism is from free expression. Because most people, many people on the internet, as we've heard and, 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 and we know, they don't have to be honest. They don't have to tell the truth. They can be as offensive as they like. They can be anonymous. They can actually reach that stage where they are generating, in the name of free expression, sometimes dangerous and hateful speech. So this is distinct from journalism. The question that we have is, you know, how do we address the, cr the critical uh, 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 crisis that is facing journalism and media, and at the same time generate much more responsibility? Media have a, 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 a face of difficulty because they have to report hate speech. Hate speech doesn't just just doesn't distend. It's not, it's not like an apple falling off a tree. It doesn't just sort of grow. It comes from somewhere. And the sources are very often very close to us. Uh, the fact of the matter is, politics itself is a generator of hate speech. 
media very often are guilty of hate speech merely by reporting the hatred that exists in politics, merely by reporting the hatred that is expressed between different communities and so on. And then media are accused of generating hate speech because they're reporting uh, hate speech. So we have to be very, very careful uh, uh, about what hate speech is and where hate speech comes from. I absolutely agree with the minister from Indonesia who's saying that maybe we should have new statements, new goals and, 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 and so on. I think that's a very good thing. I think the United Nations has much to this week, I think to reflect on positively about, for example, the actions that have been taken towards the realization of the Millennium Development Goals. I think the tremendous strides have been made uh, over, the, over the last decade. Wouldn't it be great to have, a development, uh, to have a development goal which would seek to remove hatred from, from the, the process of exchange between communities, which could identify steps that could be taken? In fact, it's extremely difficult to do that. Within journalism and within media, we are trying to address this problem. Everyone's responsibility is an important statement because it's true, but actually we have to be, we have to be careful with that statement because it's one way of putting the problem to one side and not taking your own responsibility. The fact is inside journalism, there is a debate taking place about how we work and how we can actually Im improve the quality of, of the work we do. The Ethical Journalism Network, which I'm working with, and actually has grown from the debate that uh, followed after the cartoons crisis some years ago, has actually created a new initiative in which different groups in journalism and media are now working together to try to uh, uh, confront some of these problems. And so what are the work that, well, what is the work that's being done? And I think it is actually useful because it can uh, be translated into uh, potential action in other areas. First of all, inside journalism, there is now more action to try to raise awareness of what hate speech is, how hate speech develops, and how media uh, can play a role in trying to limit the impact of hate speech. We need, <clears throat> and we're doing this, carry out surveys, investigate how these, uh, how we're working so that we can improve um, our understanding of the professional social realities in which media and journalism work. Today, journalism is a very precarious profession. People uh, can't really make a lot of, uh, make a big living out of journalism. But the fact of the matter is it remains critically important. So how do you uh, how do you encourage journalism to develop at a time when it's under political pressure, under commercial pressure, under social pressures from, from different uh, interest groups and so on? So how can we better understand the social and professional realities of how the craft of journalism works? Thirdly, we have to learn from our mistakes. Inside journalism, there is now a debate about how do we understand and learn from our mistakes. The, uh, one of the things that was carried out this year was uh, an, an investigation of how a film called The Innocence of Muslims became uh, a worldwide sensation last year, leading to demonstrations in many capitals of the world and many deaths. In fact, it was a media construct. It was a result of someone using the internet to tell malicious lies, which were picked up by media, generated and circulated around the world and rapidly translating into street confrontations, which led to deaths and more misunderstanding and more incomprehension. This is, the, this is an analysis of how that happened. Media are able to investigate and learn learn from their own mistakes. Uh, fourthly, there's the question of how can we work in partnership? The media are no longer, and journalism is no longer dominated by an elite group who set themselves aside from the rest of society. Journalism these days is an open profession. It's working in partnership. So how do we work in partnership with our audience? How do we work in partnership with politicians of good faith and uh, interest groups of good faith? It's an enormous challenge, but it's one that we're looking for. And finally, uh, and, and, and this is most important in journalism, as it is in many other areas of society, particularly the world of politics, and that is how do you generate solidarity? between different groups within different sectors where there is a much uh, competition and so on. And how do we therefore build more unity, professional unity and solidarity inside journalism around these common objectives, set standards, do good work, show humanity, but tell the truth and if necessary, also tell, tell it in a way that sometimes as cartoonists will always say is the right way, as offensive as you want to be without breaking the law. It's treading a fine line, but these are the challenges that in journalism today, for the first time in many years, I'm, I'm very pleased to say are being taken up. Thank you so much, Adrian, uh, and thanks to all of you uh, for um, both uh, presenting dilemmas, uh, 
suggesting ways to deal with them and also coming up with uh, concrete proposals. I will now open the floor. Uh, we have um, two special guests uh, that I would like to give the floor to first. Uh, and I encourage everyone to be uh, uh, short and crisp and preferably to conclude with uh, a question uh, to somebody in the audience so that uh, as many people as possible will have the chance to speak. But, but first and foremost, uh, I would like to introduce the first special guest, who is the His Excellency Mr. Armand de Drecker, the uh, Minister of State from the King Kingdom of Belgium. Please. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first thank the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the International Peace Institute for this invitation to the sixth annual Trigvili Symposium on Fundamental Freedoms. The topic chosen for this debate is very relevant. The danger of eight speeches doesn't need to be demonstrated. We understood it so clearly this morning. Conveyed by media, hate speeches can fuel the most horrible crimes, as we have seen more than once throughout history. In divided societies, the dangers, in particularly high during election periods, hate speeches can spark violence and may result in the worst cases, in a genocide. The tools at hand to prevent such a scenario will be analyzed during a side event organized later today by the Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect Ghana and Belgium. Prevention of genocide is a priority for my country. This is the reason why Foreign Minister Didier Reinders has taken the initiative to host next year in Brussels an international conference on this topic. This event, organized in cooperation with the United Nations and the European Union, will take place on 31st of March and 1st of April 2014. Belgium attaches great importance to freedom of expression, which is an indis indispensable part of any democratic society, of course. On the other hand, the fight against all forms of discrimination is also a priority for my country. Belgium is, for instance, at the origin of a biannual resolution at the General Assembly on the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. And my country is also proud to have played a significant role during the United Nations conferences against racism in Durban in 2001 and in Geneva in 2009. However, we strongly believe that the right to speak should not lead to the infringement of other human rights. This belief is enshrined in our constitution. In this regard, the Belgian Constitution reflects the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. The freedom of religion and the freedom of expression in all matters are guaranteed, except when the exercise of these freedoms leads to the commission of criminal offences. Criticism of religions or beliefs, whichever they are, is not a crime in Belgium. And everyone can therefore express its views on these topics. However, pursuant to European and international standards, the Belgian criminal law foresees that the incitement to hatred and to discrimination is a criminal offence and must be prosecuted, whatever its nature or its author. This limit to the freedom of expression constitutes a necessary measure in a democratic society to protect, among other things, the right to life. Legislation is one thing. Actually combating hatred and discrimination is quite another matter, and certainly the most crucial. I would like to share with you the importance in this endeavor in my country 
of our Center for Equal Opportunities and Opposition to Racism, the task of which is to promote equality of opportunity and to combat all forms of discrimination, exclusion, restriction, or preferential treatment. Concretely, this means that the Center monitors possible cases of incitement to hatred and discrimination and collect complaints. One of the most important added values of this Center is the possibility left to it to initiate a judiciary procedure and in this procedure to represent the interest of the potential victims of the incitement to hatred or discrimination. In combating hate speeches, civil society has also an important role to play. And we think it is important for states to support their work by, for instance, also untitled NGOs to bring a case of hatred to a national tribunal in the name of the victims. The occasion of these independent actors is particularly interesting when, like it is the case for the Belgian League of Human Rights, the national legislation does not only give them the possibility to initiate judicial proceedings against aid speeches and behavior, but also allows them to initiate judicial proceedings against the various public institutions when these institutions are not fulfilling their international obligations pertaining to the protection of human rights. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your um, contribution. And uh, our, uh, then I will have the, uh, the, the great honor to introduce our second uh, special guest, who is Mr. Victor Mukasa, uh, LGBT activist uh, from uh, Uganda, human rights defender and independent consultant, and again, somebody who is working in an environment where these issues are highly uh, relevant, to put it uh, carefully. Uh, so, Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you to the other panelists for sharing your views and and ideas. Um, yes, uh, again, I'm Victor Mukasa, and I, I am originally from Uganda, but currently living here in the United States after having fled persecution from Uganda, been here for a year. And I go right now as a senior international advisor to governments, development partners, and civil society on LGBTI human rights in Africa. Before that, of course, around the 2000s, I was part of uh, uh, the founding of the LGBT movement in Uganda. Uh, it was at a time, I came out at a time when homosexuality was kind of heard of, but uh, did not really have a face. So again, around that time, I showed up and I showed my face and I said, I am here. I am a homosexual. In fact, I was the first uh, LGBT activist to go live on radio stations and TV stations. And when that happened, for the following uh, programs that I did, there were masses of people that would wait for me outside the stations wanting to stone me or beat me up, or would say, I deserve to die. And why, why, was it, why was that the case? The people in my neighborhoods also started to treat me terribly because of what somebody else was saying. Basically, what was happening is that when I came out, political leaders who had hardly addressed the issue of homosexuality came out too and they made very, very disturbing statements in terms of name calling and describing the person, the kind of person that I am and the people that I represented. And then religious leaders also rose up and they declared us sinners, very evil, non deserving of anything that Ugandans deserved. And of course, people were listening to this. People were hearing their leaders say these kind of things. Muslim leaders saying, we should be killed or evacuated and taken to an island to die of hunger there. 
and that if you see a homosexual, this is what you do. And the media was also amplifying that voice. There was a lot of hatred, but why was it that level of hatred? Why do I become important when I come out? Why do I become important as a target for negative actions when I come out? For me, I believe it's a lot to do with fear. Fear, not just among the ordinary people, all that has been addressed here, but I would like to speak to a certain level of hate speech and action that has been experienced uh, by some of us and probably many other marginalized groups. Hate speech by political leaders, hate speech by religious leaders, cultural leaders, tribal leaders. And I think that it all lies in the issue of power and how we have constructed and got to understand power. And that if we want to stay in power, we have to do certain things. And the things we have chosen to do, incidentally, are sacrifice, sacrificing some lives. So for example, political leaders, they have come up with a strategy in order to become you know, popular and also distract people from the real issues uh, that are affecting people, the communities. You will say, start scapegoating them. These homosexuals, we have had accusations in Uganda and also other you know, LGBT people in other African countries. We have been accused of so many things by political leaders. We have been accused of spreading HIV and AIDS. We have been uh, accused of uh, b being a part of a rebel group in Uganda. Uh, and, and while this is coming up, there are so many other issues of corruption, of, of failure of the medical systems, the health systems, of failure of the education systems that people are asking questions about. How do we get people to drift away from that kind of conversation? The homosexuals are here. You know, it's the same thing that happens to the witches in, in West Africa. Or Muslims or Christians in certain parts of the world, political leaders use a certain group of people to basically blind everybody else and take them away from the issues. And of course, the media is there to am amplify that. Religious leaders have also got a tactic of where, uh, religious leaders, cultural leaders, tribal like kind of social stuff, where they, their strategy is to draw a line, divide the people, the insiders and the outsiders. These, the insiders like you, are the ones who are holy or will go to heaven and have everything good in between and deserve uh, basic human rights to be respected, their health, uh, access to health services. And the out outsiders, not that you are outsiders, but you know, just for this uh, uh, demonstration, is that uh, you are evil and you cannot be a part of us. And then the people that you're addressing basically are seeing you as a protector because one of the ways you can stay in power is to appear important and protecting your people. So you're going to keep demonizing, making it ugly who these people are. And then these will say, you are protecting us. You are our leader. It is a way to stick in power. And this is what our leaders, especially in Africa, a strategy that they are using. But how, how do we overcome this? Because once they do this, a lot of hatred is incited. And from ha that hatred, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the speech, then we are having actions of killing, you know, of, of evictions, of, of, of forcing people to become homeless, and forcing some of us out of our countries into strange lands where we feel we can hardly even survive. So what do we do uh, about that? Well, uh, uh, it's a very good thing to discuss uh, hate, cr hate, hate speech and hate crime. And uh, yes, we all recognize that the problem is there. But how do we deal with that level also of, uh, of hate speech, where leaders who actually are listened to by masses get those masses into continuing the hate speech and all that? See, the theme, again, I also go back as, uh, as the other panelists. Uh, I like that everybody's responsibility. It starts from the bottom and goes up to the top, and you know, vice versa. From the bottom, I think it is as simple as whenever we are in such spaces to recognize that there are no insiders or outsiders. To recognize that we all belong inside 
inside the human race. At the end of the day, we are all humans. And also understand the whole concept of human rights. What are they? Do, am I free to do something as long as it does not affect you? You know, am I free to say it as long as it does not affect you? Should you practice your freedom of speech, even if it's going to lead to the death of others? I think these are questions to ask, and this has to start right from family. You know, family, the family unit, that people, children, uh, we create an environment where children learn to distinguish between that that is not a freedom, that is actually a violation or an abuse, and that that is actually a right, a freedom to be enjoyed, and actually productive to the development of that family and outside there. And then also at the top, all the points that the minister from Indonesia raised, I think would be very good uh, things to share with the other states, but also a civil society for us to go out and massively educate, massively educate uh, corporations, uh, 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 policy makers about the effects of hate speech, because hate speech kills, hate speech drives us out of our countries. Hate speech makes the, 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 uh, the, the, our communities lose on serious resources because we are looking at homosexuals, this is how they do sex. We are looking at witches, this is how they do their thing, the charms, and we are looking at the Muslims. Oh, they bombed this because one Muslim did it. And then we, we begin to leave out very useful resources to the development of our economies. I am a banker by profession. I am a human rights defender who does not just deal with LGBT rights, but I defend children, women, albinos who are being killed in Africa because probably they are a source of wealth and that kind of thing. But then I find myself here in the United States seeking asylum, a long process, looking for a job to survive instead of building my country, Uganda. The very people that need me have driven me out. And I am needed and so many other people are needed. So hate speech, the absence of it, does not mean that things are okay. It doesn't mean that things are okay because there are other ways that violations happen. So I think also we need to go back to the basics, human rights in all, you know, human rights, understand the concept of human rights as, you know, a full package. Because then even with head speech, we can know and masses can know that violations are happening, abuses are happening and then encourage mechanisms that will encourage uh, bringing perpetrators because people go away. Mugabe is going away with what he's saying to mm. LGBT people in Zimbabwe. In Uganda, right, uh, right now, a minister is encouraging rape for women who wear miniskirts. It's a new bill. I don't know what's happening to my country, but those are the bills that are being discussed. A miniskirt bill, that they should be raped. And you know, you hear what if legislation is coming up for witches in West Africa. And you, you, you hear what is happening up now in, in, in Kenya after the, 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 the last terrorist attack. What the Muslims are facing right now because of what some people have said about the Muslims, oh, the Somalians. So I think that we could spend a whole day speaking, but that is what I have for uh, submission uh, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much, Victor. I, uh, I, um, I could see that that really touched uh, several strings with the audience. And I think thank you also for uh, describing so vividly the, the architecture of uh, hatred, which very often comes in exactly the form you, you said, namely that uh, somebody defines who, who are in and who are out of some group and then start uh, building credibility in the in group by defining this. And this is definitely not only something we see in Africa. This is the fundament of racism and extremism and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we have seen it so many times in our history, that dynamic of you in, in the discourse are creating difference and then you appeal for clarity and purity uh, and cleanliness in a sense of the society and, and, and you establish yourself as a leader. That's very much the, the sort of the, the intellectual architecture of, uh, of uh, hatred and it's important to see it very, uh, just, you just expressed. Now, um, we have, uh, we have uh, a privilege and a problem. The privilege is that we have uh, fantastic people in the room uh, with a lot uh, to say. Uh, and the problem is that we don't have uh, the time to say it. But we have a little bit of time. I, I, uh, I see the first uh, 
uh, arms area, I think we can take uh, three or four, but uh, only if you are able to be extremely focused, 20 seconds, and conclude with the question. Yes, uh, Joseph Klein from Canada Free Press. This is for anyone on the panel. In, in talking about incitement to violence, um, is this a notion the audience itself, like in Rwanda, to commit violence uh, against other target groups that the uh, inciter has targeted? Or are we also including situations like the Danish cartoons or the uh, anti-Muslim video last year where it's the people offended who actually commit the violence? Where, could you delineate the distinctions there, please? Thank you. I think that's a good question for Frank, and I think it's such an um, essential question. I think you should just uh, go for it. Yeah. Okay. No, very quickly. I think there's a big difference between a call for violence, which has to be in the message itself, and people that feel offended, and because they feel offended, justify violence, which is very different. I think that, as we said before, offensive speech is legitimate freedom of speech, although it is a social problem and it is an ethical problem, but it's not a legal nor a problem of responsibility of the state. So therefore, in the case of Rwanda, it was different because it was the call for genocide. It was the call for confrontation of two ethnic groups. The same thing happens with incitement to organized crime, with child pornography, because that in itself is a violation of the children used for the pornography, but also it's incitement to the more sexual abuse and violence against children and trafficking of children. Or it is, in the case of terrorism, incitement to terrorism and to be part of terrorist acts. But it is different if people just simply because they feel offended decide to commit an act of violence. And there, they only have themselves to blame. Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, important clarification. I think the second um, hand was here. Thanks. My question was very similar, and I was going to ask Aidan maybe if he could just briefly comment on the findings and the report on the innocence of the Muslims, because I think there is often confusion on the difference between advocacy of hatred that constitutes incitement and simple expressions of speech that perhaps is even hateful, maybe even more than offensive, that then results uh, in people being offended and acting uh, violently. And I'm just curious if you could maybe mention very quickly what the report concluded about the innocence of the Muslim film itself. Was the film itself intended to be advocacy of hatred that led to violence, or was in fact media reporting uh, and comments by political and other leaders itself, was that the advocacy of hatred that led to violence? Thanks to both. I think we collect a few now that a few more people can express. And these two, these two first questions were ideal examples of what is a question, which is distinct from a statement. So thank you very much for that. Stick to the same uh, principle. I, I, I have already lost control. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but there was a lady in blue, the blue jacket here, uh, who was early. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to, I'm here on behalf of Minister Mshikiwabo who couldn't make it this morning. And uh, I'm from the mission of Rwanda, uh, and I'm happy to hear that you mentioned my country. And uh, I want to talk about it regarding the hate crime um, that led to a genocide in my country. But my question is, uh, what's the role of the international community when um, a country, the government itself, um, cultivate hatred among the population and uh, people just stand there and watch and don't do anything about it. Uh, that is my first question. Another thing, I um, evolved in uh, developed countries and I saw firsthand how hatred, uh, like in schools, I was in the teaching, I have a teaching background. And um, I think that it has to start in schools because education, when you see how children are devastated because of hate um, speech from uh, their peers, really um, it is very, very devastating to see how children can even commit suicide because of uh, what they see on the internet or what their um, peers tell them. So how can we address if there is no legislation or also for teen, uh, people who are not mature, it's hard to punish them. And uh, so it has to start very early with zero tolerance in schools and uh, teach. Um, that is my contribution about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Marjorie. I think the next question was here. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, William Verdone. I want to pick up on the thread of education. Uh, 
there are vast amounts of vast countries of the world that have no education or no ability to go to school. Uh, and then you have many narrow-minded madrasas around the, the, the world that are very, uh, I guess, insightful on hatred. Uh, how do you, how, oh, North Korea, what's their educational policy? How do you address the rest of the world that, that uh, do not have opportunities to go to school? Thank you. I think I think the last uh, the the lady in the second row here uh, was very early, and I think that will be the last. I'm sorry for that because we simply do not have more time. We have to. Uh, there were big agendas for all of us. Please. Thank you. A couple of weeks ago, when Terry Jones decided to burn 3,000 copies of the Quran, there was a, uh, in a small village in Florida. There were about five or six activists that organized an extraordinary event to counter hate and to celebrate American diversity, and they gathered members of different religions all together to counter this event. And it completely overshadowed the, the, the call for hate. But and, and I work for Human Rights First, uh, an organization based in the US. We went to, to, to visit uh, their, their event. But unfortunately, there were very, very few success stories that, uh, of, of people who mobilized to combat hatred. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if anybody on the panel had some ideas of um, you know, how to promote these success stories to fight hatred, because we, we don't hear enough about them. Unfortunately, it would be interesting to know whether the media gave the same uh, coverage of the counter uh, measure than the original uh, incitement. <laughs> I think that we have to to stop the questions there. I'm sorry for that, but uh, we have to stick to time. And then I would just simply open to any one of you who maybe Aiden, got you got the direct question, but you all have a lost. Uh, just very time. briefly, look the the the. the Innocence of Muslims example pointed to two, I think, sort of critical uh, problems facing media today. One is the pressure to publish, the rush to publish. Because we live in the age of instant news, there is a real pressure, and it comes from the social networks where information is being made available and circulating, and there's a real rush to publish. And because uh, people want news instantly, that compromises the time that's available for ethical reflection. In order to resolve an ethical dilemma, you have to think about it. You have to decide, do I use that headline or that headline, that picture or that picture? Do I use that statement or that statement? How do I edit that text? It, without reflection and without a period of time for reflection, it is not possible to have proper editorial, ethical reflection. And that's one of the sort of great challenges that's, that's facing media today. Uh, and it, it, it seems to me that the second issue, uh, which is related to that first, is the problem of verification. That is to say, fact checking. And the biggest problem today, and the, and the, the cardinal principle of journalism, is truth-telling and to be accurate. Well, you can't always tell the truth. There's a big argument of what the truth is anyway. But accuracy about the facts is at least a cardinal principle that we can agree on. But in order to be accurate about the facts, you need to be able to verify. You need to be able to sort of check. And that's a massive problem because it takes that takes time. In the ca case of the innocence of Muslims, the malicious lies of a specific individual who is intent upon spreading hate between communities were taken on board and were circulated around the world and caused enormous damage. And this wasn't a problem, I have to say, of the yellow press. It wasn't a problem of the press is politically driven. Unfortunately, some of our best friends in the media of high standards, the Associated Press, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, the Guardian, all sorts of uh, media that we rely on actually were taken in by it. And when that, those lies are circulated, there isn't enough time to combat it and so on. It has a devastating effect. That, I think, in, in a way, sort of sums up the sort of problem that we've got. We don't have time for reflection. If we don't have time for re reflection, how can we be as ethical as we want to be? That's the major thing. Thank you so much, uh, Aidan. Um, no, there are, sorry, there are no time for more questions, but I want the, yeah, everybody here will get the floor. And I just want all of you, uh, um, you answer whatever you like, but if you also could comment on Martin Natalagaba's concrete proposal of trying to make some kind of um, not standard, but the kind of inspirational uh, idea of uh, how government should actually uh, do the law book. Obviously, I would say, I, th I think it's a good idea. It should be perfectly compatible with the human rights standards. We cannot sort of make something that is incompatible, but it could be some advice to draw exactly the type of distinctions that uh, you are doing. And of course, it should also be seen in light of the important distinction be between what can be government control and what is self-control self, uh, uh, of, uh, of the media. Um, um, sorry, do you like to go uh, first? No, sorry, Caroline, do you like to go first? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I thought that the, the suggestions, um, what they really kept saying to me was context. And it's about shaping a context where we start agreeing on what is acceptable and what isn't. And also creating a context in which a certain type of behavior thrives over another type of behavior. Um, and I actually thought your comment about the, the counter protest was a very, very good one. And I think it's something that we need to remember that that's an option open to us. It's not just about saying this is bad, we disagree with it. It's about providing a space in which the positive can thrive. And actually one of the loveliest things that came out of what happened to me was a hashtag started by someone inspiring women. And it's a small thing, but it took off over Twitter and everyone was sharing these stories of these amazing women in history who, had, who we didn't really necessarily know about. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to focus on. Um, and the other thing that I would say is just to sh slightly shift um, the attention onto social media companies, um, if we're talking about internet hate speech, is that they also have a responsibility to shape a context. At the moment that the context that they're shaping does is leading to mobs who are attacking other people. Um, and I don't have the answers for that, but I think it's something we need to look into. What is it about social media companies and, and the social media spaces in which we operate that leads to such proliferation of hate speech um, and, and antagonism? And the final thing I wanted to say is this difference that we're trying to make, this distinction we're trying to make between offense um, and hate speech. And the word humor has been used quite a lot um, and, and offensive humor. And, you know, Nobody wants to say that you can't tell jokes and that you can't offend people because that way lies not being able to say anything. But I think what we need to maintain a bit of perspective on is who is the butt of the joke. Satire is meant to be the tool of the powerless against the powerful. And far too often, humor is used as a defense when the powerful are attacking the powerless. And I think that that's something that I think we need, really need to maintain focus on is that if the butt of the joke is someone who has no power, then it's not funny. It's hate speech. Um, and that's really, yeah, that's the note I want to end on, thank. Thank you so much, Caroline, for that. And um, before I give the word uh, to Sarah, I want to say that uh, those of you who want to express something that you didn't have time to, you should use the internet. And you could use uh, twit Twitter, and you can use Inspiring Women, or you can use uh, IP Inspiring Inst. Inspiring Women. And, <laughs> and there's, uh, there, there's, uh, there's actually an active Twitter debate going on uh, among people who are already here, and probably a few that are watching us on TV as well. Uh, then it's Sarah, please. Sure, I just want to pick up on some of the comments from the audience. And I think um, you're right. One, one element that we should have talked about more was education. And um, I see that particularly through the lens of uh, education about the internet and digital citizenship, because we've got technologies that are coming up faster than the education system can respond to them. And they're continuing to evolve. So where there, there was you know, Twitter and Facebook, now you've got Snapchat and things where people can, can say things and, and then they, they disappear or they can't be traced back. So I think part of, um, part of the responsibility that's, um, that is everyone's responsibility encapsulated in this title of the, the panel is, is around education and around pushing uh, people to become citizens and to, to understand that citizenship doesn't stop when you're when you're using the internet and that there are uh, responsibilities that are inherent in the rights in the, the freedom of expression that flows there. Um, in terms of uh, the suggestion of the Indonesian minister around standardization, I think I think that's incredibly challenging because I think uh, a lot of uh, norms and values are specific to cultures. And I, I think that it's something that we really need to think hard about before automatically assuming that that's the solution because uh, trying to enforce a template of values globally um, has its challenges and uh, th there are risks there that we should think about fairly deeply. Um, but I think this has been a really stimulating discussion and I'm really pleased that we, we managed to work in education and the importance of that in, in the closing remarks. Thank you so much for that, Sarah, and uh, you will have the last word. Frank. Thank you. Um, Here we go. A, a couple of very clear remarks. On, on education, I agree that, it, I, and I said it at the beginning, education is a priority, but I don't think the fact that countries have weak education, developing countries, is also necessarily that serious a problem. I think there are other forms of education as well, from the responsibility of parents to specialize uh, 
courses on how to use internet. I think it's a social problem in general and it's an ethical problem. Uh, UNESCO talks about building a culture of peace. And I think the real challenge, I mean, is using education, yes, but with the goal of building a culture of peace, which means a culture of understanding and solidarity and, and, and mutual responsibility toward, toward human beings. Secondly, um, I w on the offensive speech, I understand that offensive speech, especially, I, I'm legally blind and I was born that way. So I remember being the butt of jokes. I come from Guatemala, a country where everyone makes jokes about physical matters, which is very terrible for children with disability. But in, in my case, I learned to live with it, but there's other kids that actually suffered very much. And those are issues that we have to eradicate, I agree, that are psychologically very painful. But I would not give that role to the state. That is the only difference. I think those are issues that we do have to eradicate by the indignation of society. Society has to be indignant. Uh, society parents have to respond. The schools, the churches, everyone has to respond. But I would watch not giving the state that because then you fall into what do the leaders of the state believe is offensive or not, and then you, will, you, you would easily fall into censorship. Two quick ideas. I think many of the suggestions of the minister were very good. I do fear the idea of setting standards. For me, the international standards are the human rights instruments. And what we should do on Article 20, which is of the ICC, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is probably get the Human Rights Committee to have a general comment on Article 20, which would update the interpretation of Article 20. And I think this would be setting human rights standards in the, in the sort of a specific procedure without opening it to a debate. If today we had a debate on what is exactly, this is why in my report I basically set benchmarks, how to interpret the highest level, because if we set a, de a debate on what exactly is incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence uh, on the basis of race, nationality, or gender, or of, uh, religion, I'm sh not sure we would agree. I mean, there is, that was one of the biggest confrontations at the Human Rights Council at this moment, and it was bound to be, again, and let me finish by saying something that I think is very important. The best, the best remedy to hate speech is knowledge. We hate what we don't understand and what we see as different. And may that be gender, may that be race, may that be nationality or sexual uh, options. I think this is important that we have to, and this deals with the education system, and all our education system, this I've analyzed around the world, we all study our own country, our own culture, our own language, and our own traditions. This is very important to maintain our identity. But we give all progressively less and less attention to the cultures of the world, to the peoples of the world, or to other realities. And now we have internet that can help us in that. I think there should be a major focus on building more knowledge amongst peoples. UNESCO has a beautiful phrase in, in its constitution in Article 1 where it says it was established as an institution uh, to, to promote peace in the world by facilitating the free flow of ideas and knowledge among peoples of the world. So I think peace also is based on this knowledge. We have to increase the knowledge amongst each other. An ambassador from Belgium in the, in the Human Rights Council a few years ago said the solution to bad speech is more freedom of speech. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, time, is, time is up, so uh, while I was uh, supposed now to give a substantive uh, closing uh, remark and uh, sum up everything that has been said, I will basically say that the essence of what that would have been is that we had a great panel uh, that really uh, laid out the, uh, the full picture of what uh, this problem is all about, and we had very interesting comments from the floor, and we're very happy with that. I want to uh, still to say two things. One is that I completely agree with the education and knowledge uh, argument, uh, but it's also the education of attitudes, because uh, Nazi race theory was developed by professors with a lot of formal knowledge, but uh, definitely not the right attitudes. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and my second point is that I think we should keep keep thinking about the idea of some kind of uh, standard. I mean, I, the absolute starting point must be that it is the fulfillment of the human rights uh, principles. There could be no doubt about it, otherwise we're on, in a very dangerous path. But I think that there, there are good arguments, as Sarah is saying, against trying to make some kind of 
uh, common interpretation of what the norm is, because it could be too broad in a sense. You could, the, the, so the liberal instincts can be undermined by more authoritarian control. And, 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 and to be very frank, there are a number of states out there who like this debate, not for our purposes, but because they want to have new arguments for why we can control the internet and the media and so on. And, and, and there are several of them around, and they're getting more active. So that's an argument against. The argument in favor would be that precisely for that reason, we need a broad international debate. We should not leave it to too much regional difference, but actually try to confront the issue uh, in, in a way that, just as we did today, states the utmost importance of protecting the value of freedom of speech, but also the utmost importance of having uh, clear limitations uh, when that sort of goes into the hate and, and, and incitement to violence part. And that maybe that's why at least we need a, to find some arenas for global debate. We started here. Uh, the, the Alliance of Civilization will be discussing this. I think that's good. I, 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 although uh, uh, Marty left, I, I really want to commend Indonesia for dealing with these issues. I, we, we may not necessarily always agree with what they uh, conclude, but the fact that they want to be a part of this global discourse uh, as a non-Western uh, country is actually something we should really embrace, and that's why we were so happy to have him here. And I'm so happy to have you all here, and thanks for the great work you're doing. We're leaving uh, uh, much wiser than we came, and to the extent we are confused, at least we are confused on a much higher level. Thank you for the... Thank you.